This episode of the show is presented by Tri-State Cadillac Dealers. We're coming to you from the Midtown Ainsworth. We thank them so much for hosting us tonight. We thank our audience who just cheered us so much for joining us. Uh, and John and I can't thank Joe Torrey enough for coming in to join us uh, as our special guest tonight. Uh, John and I were just sitting with Joe for about a half hour before the show talking, and it's a reminder of what a remarkable baseball life Joe has led. Uh, you know, we were talking about, I, I actually want to say it, the owners he's worked for are M. Donald Grant, Ted Turner, George Steinbrenner, Frank McCourt, and Bush, Bush. And, and Augie Bush. Amazing. And, uh, August Bush. Yeah, August. Yeah, August, August the son. The son. Yeah. Yeah. The son. Uh, and as I'm thinking about this remarkable life, I remember all the days we'd sit with you, Joe, pre-game, and I'm like, Joe is like Zelig. He's like got connections to every player, past, present, future. And then one day, Milton Berle died. And like, like at spring training girl, and Joe starts telling Milton Berle sto stories. And I'm like, who do you not know? <laughs> and so uh, I think just as a way to start, it's a re really a remarkable baseball life, a Hall of Fame baseball life, literally a Hall of Fame baseball life. Do you have something that stands out the most from the, the, the five plus, six plus decades now of being involved in, in baseball? Yeah, uh, someone, Joel, answer, asked me a question about one thing that stuck out in the time. I, it's interesting, you asked that question. And you, know, you start thinking what's unusual, and uh, I, I think the, the thing that came to mind for me first was having dinner at, um, let me see where. Let me see where. Where did I have dinner? See, I'm having a senior moment here, uh, but uh, it'll it'll come to me in a minute. No, Henry Kissinger's house. Whoa. Right now. <laughs> and I, and I'll explain that Henry Kissinger's house. You know, because first off, Henry Kissinger, and we all see him on TV. God bless him. He's 100 years old and just wrote a book. Okay, and he was a huge Yankee fan, and he was like a big kid came into my office and he was sort of hesitant to do that and Alex and uh, Derek came in and you know I have some photos with how how tickled he was to be in their company so I we get an invitation Allie and I get an invitation to go to his uh, home in Manhattan for this dinner well we have no idea who we're going to meet there that's the frightening part about this thing. We showed up early and we're waiting for somebody to come through the door that we knew, okay, that we could recognize. You know, Barbara Walters came through and, you know, all of a sudden and Mayor Bloomberg came through. And so, you know, it, it was a little less stressful. So now we sit down for dinner and there are four tables. Each have 10 people. Now, I didn't sit with my wife. I sat with Mayor Bloomberg's lady, and he sat with my wife. And then Barbara Walters was the host at this other table, and Henry Kissinger at the fourth table. And Henry gets up to welcome everybody, and the first thing he says is how thrilled he is that I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, you know, and as I look straight across the table... Uh, at my table, there's the president of the Czech Republic. And Whoa. I'm not sure what conversation I'm going to have here. <laughs> uh, but it was, uh, you know, it was a fun night, you know, once, you know, you, you got into it and uh, it was very, you know, you talk about going outside, you know, your comfort zone. Uh, that certainly... Uh, you know, would be listed as, as one of those things. But uh, I, we enjoyed it. It was a great memory for us. Joe, thank you so much for coming. It's a terrific honor. I thought we were here. finished when we talked at that table. <laughs> that was, I was quite a conversation. I, I actually wish we had taped that yeah, one. It that was, was real good. Quite a conversation. But, I mean, you had a terrific baseball life and already managed for three different teams, was a borderline Hall of Fame player. By the time you got to the Yankees, tell us a little bit, and I know Joe probably knows the whole story, but I, I think some of us don't know. How you got to the Yankees, and you were almost the general manager, right, first, and then you became the manager. I mean, you, you had just been fired by the Cardinals. Did you think you'd have this kind of opportunity? You're a Brooklyn guy. I mean, you must have been thrilled. Well, to be honest with you, I, I played for the Braves. I played for the Cardinals, and I played for the Mets. 
managed all three of those teams right. and was fired by all three of those teams. So, which is, which is great to, to speak to, to young people because uh, so many young people are just so hesitant to fail and you let them know that it's okay. I mean, it, it, there's just the great ones, uh, you know, Michael Jordan in, included, that, you know, you, you really have to be able to handle setbacks in order to really establish yourself as something special. So, uh, but, you know, I get the opportunity. I'm, man I'm playing for the Mets now. I'm playing sort of part-time. Uh, and this was in 1976. I came over in, in a trade in uh, 1970, after the 74 season. So 75, I was brutal. 76, uh, <laughs> I was better. I was hitting 300. But again, as I said, I wasn't playing on a regular basis, pinch hitting more so than not. And all of a sudden, we're, we're getting into September, and my general manager, uh, Joe, uh, Joe McDonald, Joe McDonald comes, comes, to, um, comes to me and says, how would you like to go to the Yankees? Mm. Well... I, my ears perked up and because uh, I had never been to a World Series other than buying a ticket. I had never been there. And this, 76, this was so. 76. Right. And that's the year they played Cincinnati Reds, right? right. And I, I didn't jump at it, although, you know, inside I was saying, boy, that would be really cool because I'd get a chance to go to postseason and uh, it never happened for me as a player. So, but I, I said to Joe McDonald, I said, you know, I, that sounds great, except, uh, you know, I was, if, if there was ever a change here, management-wise, I'd, I'd certainly like to be able to be considered. So with that, he, you know, got me in the room with M. Donald Grant, who was, you know, really chairman of the board with the Mets, and I explained to him that I'd, I'd like to be considered, because uh, I, you know, I was sort of toward the end. I was 36, 37 years old. And I, I said, I'd like to be considered uh, if you ever make a managerial change. And with that, they didn't make the deal. Now, I, I don't know if they couldn't come to terms with, you know, who I'm being traded for or it was what I said. But as it turned out, um, you know, we're in tide water and we're playing the exhibition game and I'm... Um, I didn't start the game. I went in the shave, you know, like those games, you know, when the game's over, hurry up and get on the bus. We're going to the airport, go back to go to Philadelphia, actually. And again, this, this is another thing I, I, to extend this uh, situation. I'm in there shaving. Joe McDonald comes in, says, how would you like to manage this team? And I'm looking in the mirror, and I see him. At first, when I see him walk in, I said, oh, he's going to get on my rear end for shaving during the game. <laughs> and um, so we flew to Philadelphia after that game, and I had to go to New York uh, to talk to M. Donald Grant. So flew to Philly, got a rent-a-car, drove to the city, I you know, spent the night at home and had a meeting early the next morning uh, with M. Donald Grant. So we make, I'm going to manage. He doesn't know exactly when that's going to happen at this point in time. But, you know, it's going to be three days from now, a week from now. And, I'm, uh, you know, it was, I'd have to look at the schedule to tell you how many days it was. But I, uh, one you know, when we agreed on this and I'm going to be the next manager, now I drive back to Philly. Come to find out that our manager, Joe Frazier, checked rooms. Okay, I'm out. I'm not there. <laughs> so he calls me in the office and he, and he wanted to know, you know, where I was. And I, I refused to lie. And I said I had to go to New York. Had to go. I said it was personal, and I said I, I had to go to New York. He said, well, why didn't you ask my permission? I said, I didn't ask your permission because if you didn't want me to go, I was going to have to go. And I, I didn't want to, you know, be, have, have insubordination be a part of my resume. So, um, 
you know, he didn't Monday. never, he never really fired me, but uh, I mean, uh, fined me, but you know, it was uncom that was about yeah, as I uncomfortable as I could possibly be, and and try and not to lie and yet not tell him the truth. You talk about uncomfortable, right? Like a couple of weeks later, they trade Seaver. Right? Yeah, well, yeah. And once I became manager, I knew that was going to happen, and uh, you know, I. I I made up my mind at that point in time I can't register in hotels under my own name because I can't tell you how many phone calls I got people begging me not to trade Seaver, but that, that decision was made way above my pay grade. You mentioned you were a player manager. I think that year there were three. It was you, Don Kessinger, Frank Robinson. I don't know that we – Pete Rose. I wonder in a day of analytics where so much is given to the manager already, line up suggestions at least, how to run a game – could you have a player manager now? Um, well, he'd probably have more time to spend uh, taking batting practice than yeah. I did. Uh, you know, because there's evidently analytics. Uh, and again, I haven't been a part of any of that. Uh, it started a little bit when I was managing the Yankees toward the end, where, you know, we hired some kids to, you know, be that, uh, you know, the numbers persons. And, and I... Um, uh, but, you know, I think, I think what analytics has done, it's, it's somewhat neutered the manager, you know, in, in certain areas. And uh, I, I'm a little concerned about that because this game is so important if you can look at somebody's eyes. And, you know, analytics really sort of bypasses that. You know, I want, you know, I want to change the subject a little and ask you about the 96 team. Um, that was not the best team, yet you won the World Series. Um, Derek Jeter did not play well in spring training. He came out of the gate. He was great the f right from the beginning. Hit a home run in Cleveland. I can basically remember that day. I'm sure he can and you home can Home run well. and over-the-shoulder catch, too. Yeah, left when, center field. when did you think you had something special there with that 96 team? Well, I, I, you know, Derek Jeter, I, I, and there was something else that happened in 96 in spring training, and that was David Cohn didn't throw very well. And I remember Don Zimmer saying to me, my bench coach, if we have to worry about him, we're screwed. <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, as it turned out, he had the aneurysm uh -huh. and had to have surgery. Uh, but Jeter, uh, I, I remember early on that, you know, basically he was going to be the shortstop. This is what I got, you know, and this is my first shot at American League team. And, uh, you know, that he's going to be the shortstop. You know, we had Tony Fernandez, who was an established, you know, infielder, shortstop especially, and, and quality person. And I, I remember saying he's going to be our shortstop. And then I, I watched Derek. Uh, we had, you know, some kind of pre-spring training get-together, you know, with the fans and, and had different events. And, and he was interviewed, and... They had said, and you're going to be the shortstop. And, and Derek said, you know, I'm going to get an opportunity to win the job. And, and I, that struck me right away. Uh, this guy's got his head on right because he, he didn't want anything he didn't deserve. And, and as you, you, know, you mentioned, John, his spring training was awful offensively and defensively too a little bit. And... And I, but the one thing I noticed every day coming in the spring training, he had a good look in, in his eye. He was just, you know, ma basically saying, I'm going to go out there, do the best I can, and hopefully it's good enough. And so he never really uh, changed that look about him. I never saw any frantic or, or anxiousness. Uh, but he, he certainly knew he was a better player than he was showing us, you know, and, and, um, you know, and I remember toward the end of spring training, there was talk about, you know, trading a guy named Mariano Rivera yeah. uh, to get a shortstop uh, from Seattle. You know, Felix maybe Fermin. Felix Fermin. Yeah. And because, you know, Mariano. The dynasty dies that day, by the way, right? <laughs> yeah. You trade Rivera, you send down Jeter, everybody gets fired. And, and, and you point. know what else yeah. happens? Yeah. I'm not here no. today. You know, I'm, I'm somewhere <laughs> else, but I'll be, I'd be watching and listening, you know. But, uh, and I, my, my feeling was, that if you wanted my opinion, we've gone this far with Derek, you know, because they were going to send him back to the minor leagues. I said, 
you can always send him to the minor leagues. You know, let him start the season. Let's see what we got and, and go from there. And then, as you mentioned, Johnny, you know, he made the, maybe made the over-the-shoulder the, over catch and hit the home run in left center field, and we were off to the races. Yeah, it was, that was a dramatic and traumatic year, right? Your brother Rocco passed away during that season. Your brother Frank needed a heart transplant. During that season, I believe during the postseason, we were kind of covering that story as, as it was going on. And one of the things that really struck me is it's, it could get so lost to time because you've been so identified with winning. But when you came to the Yankees, you were the, like one of the players combined player manager, 4,110 games, I actually looked it up again, between playing and managing who had never gone to a World Series. And I'll never forget in the old days where you could actually get into a manager's office and talk to a manager, no more, uh, I was standing with you, and you told me how much it bothered you during the World Series. That list would come on almost every year, and it would really bother you. And I just wonder, like, what it means to you that so deep into your baseball career, you got to kind of change the narrative completely on your life. Like, you're now looked at as one of the, the, the fifth winningest manager of all time, a four-time champion, six World Series. What did that mean to you? Well, it, it meant a lot. I mean, I had the opportunity... And, you know, Clueless Joe was the headline in the, in the Daily That's News. That's a different newspaper. Well, I understand that. I understand. <laughs> I was I, the one. I, yeah, I but, tell you, I was the one person who endorsed the move because I was actually covering the Angels at the time. And I knew how calm you were. And I thought you'd be perfect for New York. And you'll remember this, Joe. Right? You should have let me do I, it. It would have sounded more honest. I do remember it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it is honest. I was the one person who said that he'd be the perfect guy for this job. Well, it's interesting. You know, you come to New York and... And you've been fired three times. What the hell can they do to me, man? You know, fire me? Uh, you know, that's already been done. And, and I remember my brother Frank, you know, asking me if I was crazy. You realize how many managers this owner has had and all that? I said, Frank, I've got to find out if I can do this stuff. That's basically what I said to him. And in spring training, and I... I one thing that stuck out to me, you know, and you get David Cohn walking through, and then, you, you know, you have Doc Gooden walking through, and, and of course, Andy Pettit, I didn't know a whole lot about. Obviously, nobody did. Uh, but I knew, potentially, you know, there was better pitching than I had managed anywhere. Uh, and, and knowing uh, with, with Rube Walker, who was my pitching coach with, with the Mets and, and with the uh, Braves, you know, how he used to drill into my head how important pitching was, that uh, I, I was, um, you know, let's see. Let, let's see what happens. But I, I was excited for the opportunity, and I'm nervous as a cat opening day. I, I mean, I was, I was a wreck. And, and I remember kidding with George Steinbrenner. It was the, right before we broke camp, you know, we're playing the Mets three games or whatever it was, and, I, and, you know, how George, on both sides, actually, you need to beat the Yankees or you need to beat the Mets, depending on who, whose uniform you were wearing. And, and George came into my office talking about you need to beat these guys, you know. And, and I said, let me ask you a question, George. I said, if you had a choice of beating the Mets or winning two out of three in Cleveland to start the season – which one would you pick? He says, don't ask me that. <laughs> and I said, oh, God, that's not what I wanted to hear. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, we started the season and, um, you know, beating a very good Cleveland Indian club. I mean, they, they certainly were dynamite, as, as was a, like a Seattle club with all the offense they had. But that's when Manny Ramirez was with Cleveland, and they had a – you know, they had a juggernaut over there. Let me, let me skip to 98. I, I told one of myself where I was right, and here I was playing the idiot, I think. In, ni in 98, at the beginning of the season, remember we were in Oakland. I think you had started 0-3 or something along those lines. It was brutal. Here, here was 0-3. You, you, you won the World Series just two years earlier in 96, got to the playoffs 97, lost a heartbreaker to Cleveland, here you are, you start 0-3, and, and I'm the one, and I, th I don't know, there might have been some others thinking it at the time. I asked you if you were afraid you were going to get fired. 
You're 0 3. That was uh, a New York Post one. We had the fire meter in the <laughs> New York Post. <laughs> okay. They were, well, they were 0 and 3, and we were like uh, counting down We the just days. started being friends, by the way, yes. <laughs> tonight. You know, I, I didn't mean, like you see these how guys right we much. were. You guys only won, what, 126 what, games that I year. I mean, what did you think of those idiotic questions and that whole <laughs> scene at that time? And what became of that 98 team? Did you ever envision that it would not win 114 games? No, but, you know, I. When you work for someone like George Steinbrenner, yeah, I mean, you, you've got to be ready for whatever. And, you know, is it a possibility? I, I guess. And, yeah, we started out, we lost Oakland and then, uh, you know, where, where were we? Seattle. Seattle yeah. Uh, well, Mariano was on the DL, wasn't he? I think he started the season that I mean, year or not. I'm not sure. That, that, that was the one where they, if I remember correctly, I think, I, I, they, they kept hitting, Lupinella kept hitting O'Neill, right? Yeah. And then, like, Pettit didn't retaliate one day against it, right? That was, yeah, we sort of addressed that yeah. later <laughs> on in yeah. the season. But, um, yeah, for, uh, for some reason, he, he was, he, you know, he was Lou's target. And, but... Uh, you know, we picked up, we won the last couple of games in Seattle. Uh, and the last, I think, the last out of the last game was, uh, you know, a ground ball, the shortstop. And, you know, we, we won the ball game. It was a one-run game, and Stanton was on the mound. and So that's why I'm thinking that Mariano, of course, we had three closers, really. You had Wickman, and you had uh, Wetland, and, and Mariano. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess Mariano wasn't on a DL because we wouldn't have noticed that yet. Was he? Oh, was, yeah. okay. It, by 98, he was your closer. Yeah, right. Yeah. Cause I knew that much. Yeah. yeah. By 97, he was my closer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, our good buddy Jack Curry has a book out about the 98 Yankees, and I read it. Uh, and I have to say that one of the things that stood out, I'm sorry to say this with you here, is like, like so David Wells obviously has the perfect game that year and has a, a great season. Uh, that year ends up as your age, the guy you're using in game one. And all these years later, he was critical of you, uh, like how you handled him that year. I wonder uh, what you think of that 25 years later. And I just wonder, is he, if I was asking you, you managed in a lot of places and a lot of games. Was he as difficult a guy to manage as anyone along the way? Yeah, he was a pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no question. But he wanted to be a pain in the ass. Yeah. Uh, you know, I used to have a rule uh, that... Everybody had to stay on the field until batting practice was over. You know, and David spent, I, I, you know, he says, can I go in? I go see the trainer, you know, and I said, it's another 10 minutes. Just stay out here another 10 minutes. And, you know, I, I said, you're wasting more energy trying to figure out what reason you can give me for leaving the field. And, you know, I respected his, his ability, obviously, because he was a big game pitcher. Um, but, you know, we're friends now, and I, I, I found it, you know, comical that he was coaching the high school baseball team, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, back home and um, in the San Diego area. But, it, yeah, he and, – and I'll tell you, the guy who played Henry Kissinger for me was David Cohn. I mean, he, we had the one game in Texas where he had the big lead, and I took him out like in the, in the fourth inning or he never finished the fifth inning and he had the big lead in the game, but it just looked like he was lackadaisical. And after that, David was the one that got us together and, you know, made us go face to face. And that was in Minnesota where we went to from, uh, from Texas. And um, it, it made a difference. You know, the thing that was bothering uh, David was – that he'd look down there and somebody was warming up, you know, which mean you didn't have faith in me. And I, and I said, okay, I, yeah, I understand that. I'll, I'll make that change. And, but again, you know, you need to take your A game out there. And I'm not saying you have to win every game, but you have to give me an effort every game. So, but we came together on that. You know, you worked for some, let's say, uh, shall we say quirky owners, as Joel mentioned. I mean, obviously Steinbrenner, is the one most familiar to this crowd and probably everybody, one of the most famous owners in any sports history. Um, it didn't feel like you were in fights with him like the previous managers were. I mean, obviously, Billy Martin fired five times. Dallas Green, not that much before you, was in fights with him. 
How did you survive without any, at least becoming public? Or were there things behind the scenes that we didn't see? Um, I mean, obviously winning helped, I would think. Yeah, winning did help. Uh, but in all fairness, I, I got George on the back nine. I mean, you know, he wasn't the tyrant he was with, with Billy. Plus, Billy, you know, as we, we all know, Billy didn't want to be told what to do from anybody. And, you know, I had a boss, and the players had to know that. The only thing the players needed to know, as far as I was concerned, that all baseball decisions were made by me. I thought that was important. As far as my having a, a, a boss, you know, I didn't try to hide that, and I, and, and I respected that, because George, the owner, I mean, he certainly is the boss. And all baseball, now, nowadays it's not really like that. No. Uh, all, all baseball decisions were made by you back then. Is that yeah, right? I mean, lineups and, and, uh, and all that, you know, stuff. Yeah, he, he, George didn't always agree, but he never, you know, hmm. uh, you know had he forced me to do anything. And I can say that point blank on that one. You know, he, he said, one time, I, I forgot what it was, but I called him. He says, stop calling me. You have a way of talking me into things. <laughs> and I said, okay, I don't mind that. But I, I think the only problem I had internally with George is because, you know, we had the success early on. You know, we... You mentioned we won 125 games in, in uh, 98, and we won the World Series in 96, won the World Series in 98. Um, that you guys were giving me a lot of credit. And, and George, I don't want to say resented that, but, you know, he felt that he didn't get enough credit for, for putting the team on the field. And I, I tried to, you know, let him know that I always – thank him for trusting me with his team and uh but you know he just felt that he was being overlooked um you know you mentioned uh that the success you had you won a world series in your first year and then three in a row from 98 to 2000 so it's four out of five obviously you don't want to give that up but i, I wonder since that happened and then you didn't win another championship you went back to two more world series it was almost like you made your life tougher because you guys made it look easy. And I think this Yankee team, even after you, for Joe Girardi and Aaron Boone, has been like, well, why don't you win like that? Do you feel like you, you actually made it tougher and that it's a curse in some way to win the way you do because it's actually hard to win? It, it's hard to win, but, uh, you know, uh, you realize that, you know, we had some pretty solid people in that clubhouse. And I'm talking about character-wise, not necessarily ability-wise, but character-wise. Uh, my first meeting, and, and that, that was probably the toughest thing, Joel, for, for me to put together my first meeting, because I had to say something. You know, I had to say something. And, and you know, it wasn't the, just the pitchers and catchers, you know, you, you save your, your A stuff for, for the whole squad. And I was trying to put down notes, and, and, and the thing I noticed as a sports fan, uh, teams that win, whether it be in football or, or you know, basketball, hockey, or whatever sport it is, a lot of times they, they disappear. You know, Chicago Bears won the Super Bowl, and you know they sang, sang and danced, at, you know, <laughs> in the off season, and and that that was one thing that I felt was important was to validate who you were. Uh, and part of my my meeting that first year in '96 in, in spring training was that I well, first off. I, I said every single one of my coaches had either been a coach or a player in the World Series, and I haven't. Mm. And, and I said, but I don't want to win one. I want to win three in a row. And I had said that the first year. And it was basically to let them know that, you know, we really don't have, you know, we, we shouldn't have the ability to admire what we've done until we stop doing it. And I, I just felt, you know, once you, once you stop to admire what you've accomplished, 
whatever line of work you're in, I, I, I think you've sort of stopped. And not purposely stopped, but I think psychologically you, you, you've stopped. And, and look at the Red Sox. I, I, you know, I don't want to pick on the Red Sox because, you know, we, they, they won on my watch a couple of times. And, but, the, you know, they haven't showed up in the postseason after they won the World Series, you know, more than, right. more than one time. And, and to me, I think it's just a psychological way you approach it the following year. You just got to realize that now you've, you know, you ha- I, I always felt that you had to get better to stay the same and when, when you win a World Series. That's, that's something I, I didn't realize you'd predicted or... Well, I didn't predict it. I asked for it. Predicted's a little it, strong, know. a three-peat. Yeah. So uh, I know uh, Pat Riley... Uh, Got the uh, patent on that, but yes. copyright, so he beat you to that one, but still pretty good. Now, you obviously were remembered most as the Yankee guy, even though you didn't play for the Yankees. You played for the Mets. You were a player manager for the Mets. You are from Brooklyn. Uh, my daughter, incidentally, is a Mets fan, and she did ask me uh, about two or three weeks ago, why did I, why did I choose to become a Mets fan? Uh, it's so much easier being a Yankee fan. Um, you know, as a Brooklyn guy who played for the Mets, managed the Mets, and obviously will remember it as the great Yankee manager, what, do you, what is the difference between a Yankee fan, a Met fan, and uh, the whole experience? Well, I, I, I'm the youngest of five children, and I was born into a family that were New York Giant fans because we had three teams in New York at that time, and which was dangerous. You lived in Brooklyn, and you were a New York Giants fan. You know, that's, that's just not kosher, as we say. Uh, and, and automatically, if you rooted, whichever team you rooted for, automatically you hated the other two, okay? So I hated the Yankees because they won all the time. And I hated the Dodgers because they were in competition with the Giants. And as it turned out, I managed both those teams. You know, so, and it was... Uh, 09 was the, was the one I'd, you know, I'd like to do over again, managing the Dodgers, because I thought we should have been, you know, we should have beat Philly that in 09, you know, but we didn't have somebody, you know, we didn't have anybody who could close it for us. Well, that would have been quite a World Series I, against the Yankees. I, and you know, Alex, it's one of those things you, you don't look forward coaches, to. Right? Yeah. 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 It's one of those things you don't want to have happen, but you'd look forward to. You mentioned 09 with the Dodgers. What's, you have a biggest Yankee regret? Yeah, I have one Yankee regret, regret when we had those, those bugs in Cleveland that I didn't take my team off the field. I knew field. that was coming. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't take my team off the field. It was, but who would think of that? I mean, really. It, you know what? It, 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 it was the right thing to do because, you know, when Chamberlain looked in at me and he said, I can't see. I can't see. And I sent the trainer out there. Uh, Gene Monahan and, and he sprayed him with all kinds of stuff. Little did I know it was it was Shadow Brian for the for those <laughs> bugs that were chewing on him. They liked it, and they they seemed to love it. But that was the one thing that uh, common sense said to take your team off the field, and I didn't do it. Joe, you know one of the, one of the things is uh, I John mentioned it earlier. What a good player you were. I thought I was looking for a stat. This is amazing to me. I didn't realize this with as much as I've thought about and written over the years. 2,326 wins as a manager, 2,342 hits. You had almost the same amount of hits as wins, and the wins is the fifth most in history. And I saw it like Ted Simmons went in the Hall of Fame, and I'm not sure that he had a better baseball career as a player than, than you did. When you didn't get into the Hall of Fame initially as just a player, did you have... A lot of anger, frustration. Did you think you were that guy? No, because, you know, that wasn't, uh, you know, I, it, it, it's somebody else's decision. It's not mine. And I never, I, I, not that you didn't, you know, you always respected Hall of Famers, but I, I never, you know, wanted to politic for that because I, you know, somebody has to make a decision and everything's sitting there in front of them, you know, and I, I felt that, not having been in postseason hurts, you know, when, when you know, the people who vote are, are looking at the Hall of Fame. I mean, uh, Brooks Robinson, 
was, you know, obviously a great player. He was a good hitter, a great player. Uh, but I think his, you know, probably his postseason record maybe got him in on the first ballot. Yeah. Not that he wasn't being a Hall of Fame, but I'm not sure he'd be a, hall, a first ballot Hall of Famer. So, so having not, you know, not having been in the, in the postseason, I, I think, you know, played a part in that. And I, you know, and then all of a sudden I find myself managing the Yankees and now I have more wins than Miller Huggins, you know, and I'm saying Miller Huggins, you know, he's <laughs> Babe Ruth's manager. And, and I, I got to tell you this one, uh, uh, Billy Crystal, who does all kinds of voices, right? Yeah. I get a call and, uh, and a voicemail. You always want to leave me a voicemail. Hey, Joe, this is Miller Huggins. Screw you, <laughs> you know, and then hang up, you know. But uh, it, it uh, that stuff really got my attention. The the number of you know wins, and I had you know I was a hundred games under five hundred when I got there, and uh, to finish up with that many, you know, I had a special group of guys. I mean, they they, you know, they they never got tired of winning. What can I say? And it should be mentioned, just so I finish the story, 2014 Hall of Famer. So, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, I, and I really, truly believe you didn't get angry. I think that's probably your best, or one of your best traits is the temperament, that you just didn't get upset. These didn't, things didn't upset you. Um, I, you, get, you get upset, but, you know, you... John, I, I, what's important? He never yelled at you. He yelled at me a bunch, just so you know. Oh, I yelled at you. <laughs> he did. Yeah, yeah, he yelled, yelled at me. I think no, I got him my... in spring training. I got oh, him in yes, spring training he did. one time. That's exactly right. I but, was wrong, by the way. But, but the one thing, yeah, well. <laughs> That's a first. But it was legitimate questions you asked. I, I'm, you know, you didn't go out of your way to, to ask questions. It was just something that was the flavor of the day. Yeah. Uh, but it... Was... it, it um, you know, it was just just something as as manager that um, you you never forgot what it was like as a player. You know, everybody says, "Oh, you're so calm on the bench." No, you, no, you, you're not calm, but you know that the camera's going to be on you if something bad happens or good happens, and you try. You know, I, players strike out. I struck out with the bases loaded. You know, if I thought that my manager was throwing stuff in the dugout, I wouldn't like that. So I always felt that it was important to never forget what it was like being a player. And, and I, I just wanted to be there for these guys. As long as I, and again, maybe it was my, the early years when I managed clubs that didn't win was the fact that I only uh, really, you know, the, the, what I thought of a player, if he came and played as hard as he could and do the best he can, that's all I can rate him on. Uh, you know, not how many home runs or, or strikeouts or whatever. Uh, but if you do the best you can, that's all we can ever do in whatever line of work we're in. You know, you mentioned uh, like George wasn't exactly George, especially those last few years mm -hmm. that you managed him. Uh, you know, how his son came forward a little more, uh, Randy Levine came forward, and Brian Cashman kind of took over. You did not leave under great circumstances, right? Like, you were angry about how much money they offered you to come back that last year. I wonder if you could tell us how you felt, and do you feel like fences are mended? Like, are you a New York Yankee now? Oh, there's no question. Yeah, I'm, uh, I, you know, I think what happened the last couple of years there, I think neither one of us, in all fairness, neither one of us knew how to say goodbye. Um, you know, certainly I didn't want to leave. It was my hometown. We had success. But there's a, there's a time when, you know, you need to move on. Um, but what upset me when uh, after the uh, 07 season, uh, they offered me a one-year contract, and they offered me $5 million, which obviously is a, is a lot of money. Uh, I was making more money at the time, uh, and so it was a pay cut to me. And it, it was an insult, I fat. Again, not that $5 million was an insult. I stripped my name, stretched the imagination. But they presented me with a contract that had incentives. 
and that was an insult to me that I you felt that you had to motivate me or or incentivize me in order to manage better, and and I I just I, I felt it was just time to just to take everybody off the hook and and just leave, and I and I had no uh, I thought I was going to be a broadcaster, you know, and then all of a sudden the Dodgers expressed interest and. You know, I listened, and um, you know, it, it, w it was great. I enjoyed the three years out there, and uh, and you know, I, I after the second year, I said maybe we'll do it longer than three years. And then that third year, you know, we didn't play very well, and I just felt that that the players needed to hear somebody else in the clubhouse. You know what? We spoke over there before, and one thing I didn't know, of course, Joel knew it because he knows everything, but. Um, you were close to being the Yankee general manager. Tell oh, us yeah. exactly how this came about in 96, right? And why did you not take that job? 95. I, ni 95 well, like, yeah, going the, into 96. Yeah. Uh, you, you were offered the job and didn't take it, and then later you, they gave you the managing job. Yeah, the, um, I get a, uh, well, I was fired first off in June uh, by the St. Louis Cardinals, and, and I was, with a couple of buddies in Vegas, and I get a call from Stick Michael, Gene Michael, who was, who was the general manager at the time, but he was going to a different position. And, um, and he asked me if I'd, you know, if, he, if I'd be interested in talking to him about being the general manager. I said, sure, because when you're fired, you know, somebody wants you, you jump at it. And, you, and I flew to Tampa and had lunch with, with both Stick and Joe Malloy, who was the president of the Yankees at the time. And, you know, they, we, we chatted back and forth for an hour or an hour and a half, whatever it was, and they offered me the job. And I, and I asked a question that I pretty much knew the answer to, and I, and I said, is there, there any vacation time? And uh, knowing working for George Steinbrenner, and they said no. I said, well... You know, thanks for the offer, because my wife was like seven months pregnant with our daughter, and I said, I, I just can't make that kind of decision at this point in time. And two or three weeks later, I get a call from Arthur Richmond, who was one of George's assistants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, An Arthur Richmond fan. And Arthur, our, well, he was my, my traveling secretary with the Mets, you know, so I, I, I already had, uh, you know, an inoculation with Arthur Richmond and and he said, "Would you like to be on this this short list of guys being considered to manage?" I said, "Sure." Um, and you know the the other three were Tony Larusa, uh, Davy Johnson, and Sparky Anderson. Well, Sparky had retired. You know when we had replacement players, he had had enough and he retired and didn't want to come out of uh, retirement. Uh, Davy Johnson had the Baltimore Oriole job. You know, start that, and and Tony Larusa took over where I was. I left in St. Louis, so they got stuck with me. Well, and, it, worked and that was that. Well. it worked out it pretty worked out well pretty well for, me for too. everybody concerned. Uh, last thing I wanted to ask you: this was advertised as an all all star preview or first half uh, look back at. So, I mean, the two headlines for me are the new rules and Otani, the first half. What are your thoughts on the new rules, and can you believe Otani? I mean, I can't even believe it. it it's once in 100 years. I mean, somebody, you know, it's ridiculous. I mean, he's so good at, at you know, both parts of the game, at the pitching at, and, the, and the hitting. Uh, and he's, you know, he's basically, you know, done it every year you know it's remarkable and it looks so easy for him uh, I, I think he's a remarkable athlete I don't know where he's going to wind up evidently what after this year he's a free, yeah, free agent, agent. Yeah. Yep. Um, Queens is that direction <laughs> <laughs> and the new rules I you know I was a little skeptical at first um, I mean I could do without the bigger bases I mean I, I don't know what a big advantage that provides. But when I was in spring training, you know, because I still have some connection with MLB, I, I do some spring training meetings, and I was watching in Arizona, 
watching the game with the clock, and right away it just reminded me of the game that I played back in the 60s and 70s, you know, where I, we didn't have a clock, but the pitcher got on the mound and, and, and pitched. And I don't know, if, and we all know the game's now about average two and a half hours, but I, more so than that, uh, it's eliminated the dead time in the game, which if you're sitting in the stands or watching at home, just with nothing going on, our game is not fun to watch, especially with the fact for a couple of years you had more strikeouts than hits, and, and it, it's, there's no action on the field. Now there's action on the field, and, and uh, I think, uh, you know, they made great decision. Uh, I wasn't, and, you know, part of it. I was there when they started doing this in the minor leagues to see how it would work, uh, and, and, you know, it, it's, been, um, it, it's been a great add-on. Just because Joe's done everything we should add, you were mentioning you were – MLB's chief baseball officer for about a decade uh, before you just became like an emeritus guy who works with the commissioner. The time monster is going to get us, so I'm going to ask two quick questions to get us out. It is the 25th anniversary of the 1998 team. You've seen a lot of baseball, Joe. You've seen a lot of stuff along the way. Was the 98 team the best team of all time? It would be hard to say no because of what you have to go through, you know, to get to the World Series and – they were remarkable. They really were. And, and, you know, we played a little shaky in, the, in September, a game or two. I remember having a meeting after a game that we lost to Tampa. And I said, you guys spent the whole summer making teams afraid to play you, and then you show me this. You know, and I, as I was turning around looking at the players, Bernie Williams is in the corner going. <laughs> and it's my love, Bernie. He's like a son to me. But uh, that, that club was remarkable. Um, you know, we had the little shaky postseason in Cleveland with the, you know, Knobloch play and, and whatever. But, it, it, you know, again, the 114 didn't last long because, you know, Seattle had 116. But, you know, we were able to stop them before they got to the World Series. And uh, so, I, you know, with everything, knowing you had to win – uh, not only the fact that you won more games than anybody else, but the fact that you were the Yankees, uh, that was pressure packed because, you know, it, it was just expected and, and we were able to live up to it. Yeah, El Duque was the key game, right? Oh, El Duque. Yeah, El Duque, we're in Cleveland, and, and what was it? Uh, we were down two games to one, right? right? And, and it was a Sunday. I'll never forget that. And, and I'm sitting, and it's like a late start, and we're, we're having – you know, we're having our late breakfast, and, and, you know, they were short help in the hotel. And I look up, and there's El Duque picking up dishes and doing, you know, different things, helping out in the <laughs> dining room. And I remember Steinbrenn had called me up to his suite uh, because he was a little jumpy. He says, what do you think? And uh, I said, I don't know. I, I think we'll be fine because Duque is down there. He hadn't pitched in 10 days or whatever the heck it was because we kept winning before his turn came. And I said, but he's down there, relaxed as can be. And he, he pitched a gem for us and got us back on track. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the Safe at Home Foundation, which you began more than two decades ago. Uh, I believe the Post and the show are making a $950 donation to uh, Safe at Home Foundation and the great work you do. And so I'm going to ask you the toughest question on the way out. Who is a bigger pain in the ass covering you, me or John? <laughs> He's thinking. Mm. You didn't think this much on any other question tonight. Uh, can I come back next week? Yeah. And, and very uh, calm. I mean, I, I'd say you guys were a photo finish. <laughs> He's yeah. very kind. Thank you. Yeah. The best. Yeah. We want to thank Joe for joining us. Uh, this episode was presented by Tri-State Cadillac. We want to stop, uh, thank the people here at the Ainsworth. The post uh, is the show uh, every week. You join us. Don't forget Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcast. These five-star ratings, they do mean something. Please give us one when you get a chance. Uh, I'm not sure when we drop on the Yes Network this week. I assume tomorrow, Friday. I usually get to say Wednesday. And stick with us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman.